Okay, what we're going to read here is on the emptiness and dependent origination. So why I'm reading this is that this is many years of compilation of extracts, sutras, and the, the points uh, on the meditation. Okay, on the meditation on emptiness, and some of them, they are, they are to, to trigger trigger um, a trigger to see the value see the see the profundity and the preciousness of engaging in the practice of the wisdom of emptiness and uh, some of them are the the direct um, the meditation pointers to meditation and some of them are the sharing of the experience of the meditative emptiness so they are so very precious uh, for example one thing that I like to know the I think two things that I like to share here one is that the Acharya, the Acharya Aridheva, Arinagarjuna's, the, the, the chief disciple, what he said in four stanzas is that the, those with less merit will not even have a doubt in this teaching on emptiness. Should there be a doubt, it will shatter the samsara into pieces. So this is a great inspiration for us and is a great pointer for us, the fact that the fact that the, the miseries are there, and then how to get over these miseries. There are so many teachers who came on this earth way before, many teachers before Buddha Shakyamuni, many after Buddha Shakyamuni, and Buddha Shakyamuni himself. Uh, then, rationally speaking, logically speaking, and the common sense, speaking from the point of view of common sense, um, then we can see, and then through your own understanding, after learning all these things, we see that without the experience of emptiness, we will continue to be in the dream. And within the dream, we try to run away from the problems within the dream. And in the first place is the dream created. And the dream is not really from the object. We see it as so real. That is a loss of freedom. We see it as real, and then we act accordingly. So that, say, the involuntary moving, moving towards, running away from, and so forth, while there's nothing really there from the object, this is known as the loss of freedom. Loss of freedom is misery. Misery is samsara. So this is a precise understanding of what samsara is. The fact that, one, we can say the loss of freedom is samsara. Number two is living, living in the creation of one's own self-grasping ignorance. This is samsara. Living in the world of the creation by one's own self-grasping ignorance. Living in the prison created by one's own self-grasping ignorance. That is samsara. Okay. So with this in mind, only when you realize, only when you wake up from this, then you see that, why should I be in this prison of my own mind? You're freed from the prison of one's own mind. You stop rejecting things. And then say, why should I be, why should I be behaving? Okay, how many, for how many of you, once in a while it happens, say, you fall asleep, you start dreaming. And it's quite, um, not like a sudden sucking up in the dream, more like a gradual process. Gradual process, you're first wide awake, still in the bed, wide awake, and then slowly, partially sleep, and then going to sleep. Okay, there's a process there, process. In this process, you know that you are, you are in a bed, you are just by yourself, then the dream starts to occur, then in the dream, there are the contents, people start to come in the dream, and then you start communicating with the, the people there. And suddenly you are aware that it's just a dream, why I'm talking. Is this something you are aware of once, once in your lifetime? Moi, anyone else? Two? Anyone? Chanjubla? Okay, quite several of you. Okay, so there, the moment we realize that, okay, why am I talking? This is not real, it's just my dream, right? I'm not yet asleep. I'm not falling asleep. So what? I'm talking. So why I'm talking? It's just my mental projection. Okay, so this awareness. The moment you are awakened from this type of ignorance, 
then you see that there's nothing really there from the object. And this is not what your mind is exaggerating. This is reality that you are discovering. And the Buddha did not come to invent the reality. He came to, to discover the reality and teach us that we should also discover this. And this reality existed way before the Buddha Shakyamuni came on this earth. Yet, nobody discovered it on this earth till the Buddha Shakyamuni appeared. This is the reality. So look at all the other traditions. Look at all the other traditions. It's grounded on the belief that there is some objective, permanent, unitary, independent there. Either, the, either there's some entity agent there, or the agent inside, he, in, agent here, which is the partaker, which is the creator, which is a partaker. This is what has been till Buddha Shakyamuni, after Buddha Shakyamuni. And it's only the Buddha Shakyamuni who taught this. And this, again I'm saying this, this is not what he said, okay, this is what I have I've got from somewhere. No, this is what I've discovered. This, this is reality which existed way before me. So just discover this. Use your common sense, use your reasoning, part of your mind, and you will see this yourself. So this is what he said. And then all these great teachers, Arendigarjuna and so forth, they, they experimented this, what the Buddha said, and they realized that this is so precious. So Arendigarjuna, in all his writings, he never, he never uh, praised the Buddha for praised the Buddha for having performed miracles. He never praised the Buddha for that. He only praised the Buddha for always, always for teaching emptiness, for teaching dependent origination, for teaching the harmony of emptiness, dependent origination. This is how he praised the Buddha Shakyamuni all the time in all his texts. The, the genre of the, the corpus of the, the, the five major texts by him on emptiness, look at each and every salutation. You see he saluted Salutation is made to Buddha Shakyamuni for having taught dependent origination, for having taught emptiness. Okay, so if you get a glimpse of this, you'll feel that, okay, this is meant by the final rest of my mind. My mind, since time immemorial till now, have been always pulled, pushed, pulled, pushed, pulled, pushed, pulled, pushed, pulled, pushed, pulled, pulled, pushed, pushed. It's so tiring, so tiring, never rested. Today, for the first time, I find rest. My mind finds rest. This is so beautiful. Okay, one. Then number two is that the first paragraph which, the, which is extracted there, the Buddha, Shaky, Buddha Shakyamuni was the, having di not really dialogue, was more like asking Manjushri, Ara Manjushri, about rhetorically asking, not like a real question, Ara Manjushri gives answer, no. Just like a teacher asking the student, um, that Buddha Shakyamuni is comparing two Bodhisattvas. One Bodhisattva uh, who, who became Bodhisattva, who generated Bodhicitta for the last many hundreds of years, and, but without the wisdom of emptiness. And then the other Bodhisattva, other Bodhisattva who is just newly being. Uh, who newly became a bodhisattva, but with the wisdom of emptiness. Then the Buddha was comparing these two bodhisattvas and then asking, say, the deed, any deed the two of, the do, two of these bodhisattvas do, which is more excelling? So the Buddha himself gave the, they gave the response by saying that the one deed done by the bodhisattva, who with the, although newly became a bodhisattva, but with the wisdom of emptiness that far excels the enormous virtues the other bodhisattva without wisdom of emptiness does for all these many years. So the wisdom of emptiness plays a very important role to give a quality, give a quality to the merit, to the virtues that we engage in. Okay, let's read this. <clears throat> and as we read, as I said earlier, just Try your best to let your mind flow with the meaning. Let your mind flow with the, um, the reflection, meaning, and the experience to the best you can. Given by the precious, okay, together. Given by the precious Charles Sutra, Manjushri, whoever listens even with doubt to this teaching in emptiness, 
generates much greater merit than the Bodhisattva, who, lacking skill in means, practices the six professions for a hundred thousand aeons. This being so, what need is there to say anything about a person who listens to this teaching without doubt? What need is there to say anything about a person who imparts the scripture in writing, memorizes it, and also attaches it and, th and extensively to others? The treasure of one thus gone sutra. Any person who possessing all these ten great known virtues enters into the teaching of the selflessness and has faith and are from the beginning pure of true existence does not go to a bad rebirth. Section on subduing devil sutra. Any bhikshu realizes that all phenomena are absolutely pacified of inherent existence, and the beginning of defilements is devoid of self-nature. It will remove the guilt of having defilements and make unstable their defilements, thus deeming even the immeasurable negativity is dysfunctional, let alone the secondary wrongs done associated with ethics and rituals. Aradeva's 400 verses on the middle way. Those with less merit will not even have an inquiry into this dharma of ultimate reality. Should an inquiry ever arise in someone, it will shatter samsara into pieces. <clears throat> I shall chant the entry in the middle way. Even as an ordinary being, when hearing about emptiness, if one experiences with an utter joy again and again, tears flowing from such pure joy, most in one's eyes and hair, one is the seed of the wisdom of full awakening. Upale requests the sutra. Various delightful flowers blossom, and the sparkling supreme golden abode stands so alluring. For none of this is their creator. They are posited by the power of thought. It is through the conceptualization that the world is imputed. Bhikkhuni Vajira's utterance in the fundamental vehicle sutra. The mind is demonic, which views the true self. You have a wrong view. These composition aggregates are empty. There's no being in them. Just the one designated as a card, in dependence upon a collection of parts. So we assert a conventional sentient being, in dependence upon the aggregates. Venerable Shavara's writings. Searching for reality throughout space, one finds not the periphery nor the center. All perceptions cease completely. Likewise, through a thorough search of mind and phenomena, one finds not even an atom of essence. Since the searching mind is not found, not seeing anything is seeing the reality. Saint Saraha's writings, by entering into emptiness but devoid of compassion, one will not find the supreme power. By meditating upon compassion alone, one will not attain liberation but remain in samsara. The one capable of grasping the unit of the two will not remain in samsara, nor about in personal nirvana. King of Concentration Sutra. Just as in the dream of a young girl, she met with a boy and saw his death. Joyous was she at the meeting, and in anguish at his death. We were all phenomena as thus. Arendigarjuna's fundamental wisdom of the middle way. Ceasing of actions and afflictions leads to nirvana. Actions and afflictions arise from conceptual thought. These arise from mental elaborations. Elaboration ceases through Neither the aggregates, no different from the aggregates. The aggregates don't depend on him, nor is he dependent on them. The Tathagata does not possess the aggregates. What is the Tathagata? That which dependently originates is posited to be empty of independent existence. That being dependently designated, this is the middle way. Since there is no phenomenon that is not dependently originated, therefore there is no phenomenon that is not empty. Are Nagarjuna's precious garland. If the person is not earth, not water, not fire, not air, not space, not also consciousness, and not all of them, where is the person out of those? Just as the person is not truly existent, see each element also is not truly existent as the aggregations of their own constituents. Are Nagarjuna's commentary on Bodhicitta. Those who understand this emptiness of all phenomena, yet also conform to the law of karma and its results. This is more amazing than amazing, that is more wondrous than wondrous. Aridevas found it verses on the middle way. When dependent arising is seen, ignorance does not occur. Thus, through all efforts, try to find this subject. His Holiness, the seven Dalai Lamas, guide to the view of the middle way, a song of the four mindfulnesses. The sphere of 
appearing existing phenomena is pervaded by the space of the ultimate clear light of suchness. There is an ineffable ultimate reality. View this nature of emptiness through abandoning mental contrivances, but place it in the ambience of reality. Through not losing mindfulness, hold it in the ambience of reality. At the crossroads of the six collections of consciousness, that of diverse perceptions, are seen the hazy dualistic phenomena which are baseless. There is a magical show that is by nature deceptive. Don't believe them to be true, but view them as having the nature of emptiness. Don't let your mind go astray, but place it in the nature of appearance emptiness. Through not losing mindfulness, hold it in the nature of appearance and emptiness. His Holiness, the seventh Dalai Lama's prayer for proliferating the, the okay, twelfth, the fourteenth Dalai Lama's prayer for proliferating the Dharma's land of snows. Venerable Marpa Lozawa, Shebe Dorjim, Jizumilarapa, and so on. The host of the precious Kaikyu, the source of blessings, the chain of the unexcelled masters of this outstanding tradition. To you all I pray, may the Buddha Dharma of the land of snows blaze forevermore. All phenomena are encompassing samsara and nirvana, are but the radiance of spontaneous awareness. Awareness itself, devoid of elaborations, is realized in the dhar- nature of dharmakaya. Pervading all existences and appearances of samsara and nirvana is a great Mahamudra. May the Buddha Dharma of the land of snows blaze forevermore. In praise of Dharma Dadu, impermanent suffering and empty. These three, they purify the mind. The Dharma that is unsurpassed in purifying the mind is a lack of intrinsic nature. Concluding prayer in Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary on Arya Nigarjuna's fundamental wisdom in the middle way. Throughout my official lifetimes, may I all be guided by Arya Manjushri and be able to uphold the Dharma in general and the teachings of dependent origination, in particular, even at the cost of my life. Okay, page 208, the next page. The next page, this is a very important passage. Extracted from Shri Heruga Sadhana. Okay, I'll quickly explain this. Um, Shri Heruga is the, the, the sacred name of one of the Buddhas, tantric, the Buddhas in the Tantric system, Shri Heruga. And um, how the Buddhas, they choose their names, the sacred names, for example, Shri Heruga. Uh, it's not just randomly chosen or somebody gave the name. It is with a tremendous compassion that even the sentient beings, they just hear this name, reflect on the meaning, meaning of this name. The awakening happens. It's not what we call as the liberation to what, through hearing. This is not the, the point. The point is that look at each word. Look at each word. You know the meaning every time you, you say this, utter this whole this sacred name, Shiri Heruka. You should be connected with a very profound meaning there. So what's the meaning? Shiri Heruka. There are four, there are four parts to this. Four parts. And the four parts, the four parts say, how this name is chosen is that the, is related to the, the remedy to overcome our negative emotions, remedy to overcome the afflictions, and overcome the defilements which obscure this beautiful Buddha nature. So what is the remedy? For that, we need to know the defilement. And the defilements, we come to know that it is finally, it is a self-grasping ignorance and a subtle stains. So what is the self-grasping ignorance? self grasp ignorance say how we how we the how the developments arise for example say the um, say say uh, we meet with a person we meet a person and the person shows little you know unhappiness with you or say usually and greet you good morning and one day doesn't greet you good morning and you greet good morning and the person doesn't pay any response and leave then you feel also agitated so we see that all the agitations and the say the negative emotions attachment anger jealousy all this arise some are connected with when you as a person interacts with the world then the emotions arise, emotions are triggered. In other words, you, in a more subtle form, when you interact with the dream that your conception, your self grasping then creates, then the, the pull and push happens. So what is the pull and push? The mental defilements. 
In other words, the mind not in its true form. The true form, the mind is resting. Now the mind cannot rest because there's objects created there and you're being put in push. Now we see that how these emotions are stirred is through this self interacting with the world object. Object and this self is also dreamlike. Object is also dreamlike. On the contrary, we see self as subject real. We see the object as subject real. Now we see that with these two things, seeing things object real, objects as object real, the subject, the person as object real, come together, the sound of the agitation, sound of the loss of freedom ultimately arises. The mind is constantly then moved. So there then, on the same, Shiri Heruka. Now, the, the, this, even the, the sacred name of the Buddha Shiri Heruka is to counteract that loss of the freedom. Let loss of freedom and loss of the, the freedom and the subtle stains. Loss of the freedom is due to the self grasping ignorance and the subtle stains, the cognitive obscurations. So, how this sacred name, Shiri Heruka, is the counter, the, the, the counter force, it counteracts or it's the counter force. Uh, to this uh, to this loss of freedom is this sacred name has four parts shiri heruka so first we put the shiri as the model of conclusion keep it last heruka shiri heruka shiri so hey hey okay let's see my right hand let's say this is you my right hand, right hand this is you or oh, let's say you as a person, and then you interact with the world. That's object, the phenomenon. Phenomena other than the person. You are the person, and you interact with the, the phenomena, the world, the phenomena, which is other than the you, other than the person. So person and phenomena too. So you see the self, yourself, the person as object real. So that is the self-grasping ignorance of the person. Then you project the, the phenomena with which you interact, other than the, the self, to object real. This is the self-grasping ignorance of the phenomena. Self-grasping ignorance of person and self-grasping ignorance of the phenomena, other than the person. Two. So what we do is that first, hey, shiri heruka. Keep shiri last, hey. With hey, what should we what we should be thinking of is all these phenomena which with which I'm interacting now. All these phenomena, they are like dreams. Although these are there are phenomena there, but the phenomena they are not from there. They are there, they are not from there. The dream, the movie. In the movie theater, it's on the screen. It's not from the screen. It's from the projector. The movie is on the screen, but it's not from the screen. It's from the projector. Likewise, everything is there, but they're but they're not from there. Everything is on the object, but they're not from the object. It's all from the subject, like the movie projector. Okay. So, what is that movie projector? The mind. Then what happens is that you dissolve everything as a play of your mind. Just the, like the dream. All contents of the dream is nothing but the play of your dreaming mind. Your dreaming mind projects everything in the dream. You won't believe. Only if you are a little observant of this phenomenon. You dream and you see, the, you see this beautiful hall. And look at all these details. Or up the ceiling, the AC, this, look at this, the, all these designs inside through which the cool air is sand. And then each one of your clothes, they have the, the what? The, um, one then, what is the, the, what is that picture in front of you? What is that? Okay, the, the Cheng Yabla, what is there? Cheng Yabla, Cheng Yabla, what is there? <laughs> No, you, he did not notice it. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's just looking at now. What is the property something? Right? Okay. So what I'm seeing is I look at all the, look at this, the, 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 these paint, the, these, uh, what do you call it? Frames. Beautiful frames. Amazing frames. And look at these fans. 
the fans with all these wires there to protect the fan inside. And look at the, on the, the white boat, all these details, I don't know what was written there. <laughs> right, there are so many details there. You can't believe that my mind can project each details. You won't be, if this is, this all coming from mom, no, my mind cannot possibly project all these things. You wake up, you'll be amazed to realize that these are all my mental creation. This is a part of your mind. How your mind can project everything. So we see the moment you wake up, everything that you project in your mind, they're all drawn, dissolved into your mind. So your mind becomes the source of the phenomena. Your mind becomes a source of phenomena. All phenomena dissolve the mind, even the mind. Where is this mind? The first moment, second moment, third moment, fourth moment. You analyze like this, even the mind dissolves. So now, temporarily, temporarily, what we have is the phenomena and the person. Phenomena and the person. Now you have dissolved the phenomena by dissolving the ultimate source of the phenomena. Phenomena meaning phenomena other than the person. All this phenomena, the diversity, innumerable, the, the number of the, the things, details that you find in this universe, they all dissolve into the mind, and the mind also dissolves into emptiness. So now with this ultimate source of all phenomena, which is the mind, when it dissolves, all phenomena dissolves. This is the selflessness of, selflessness of, uh, selflessness of the phenomena. So, hey, when you recite, hey, this should remind us that all the phenomena, selfless of phenomena, hey, it should remind us of the selfless of phenomena. That all phenomena, however innumerable details they are, they all dissolve the mind, and mind dissolves the emptiness. They all dissolve the emptiness. Now I realize the selfless of phenomena. The object with which I, I interact, they dissolve. Okay, look now, two hands. One hand, one hand symbolizing your mind, your mind. Okay, let's say uh, this hand is the self, the person, and this is a phenomenon with which you interact. So this phenomena, which is nothing but the play of your own mind, they all dissolve the mind, and the mind is also emptiness. So what happens? This phenomena with which you interact dissolves. What is left now? The person's left. So you have seen this selfless of phenomena. Now the person's left. Ru. Ru, as you say, Ru, this should remind us of the, even this person, now the person's left. Even this person, even this person is like a dream. The first person is just constituted of six elements. Six elements, none of the six elements is this person. Different from this six persons is the, 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 not the person. There's no person that's different from this. So from the object, there's nothing that's the person. The, okay, now look, the person dissolves. Earlier there was the duality. The person and the phenomena. Earlier there was a duality. Then with the hay, the phenomena dissolves, self as phenomena. Then the ru, the person dissolves, self as a person. Now the duality dissolves. The duality too dissolves. Okay, so now what is the state? Now the state left is the state of the non duality. That is left. But now the state left is non duality. Ka. He ru ka. Ka. Ka is the non-duality. That is the state left there. This is the ultimate experience. Ka. Now Shri. Okay. What is experiencing this non-duality? Your wisdom. Your wisdom is the one which is experiencing this non-duality. This wisdom. The non-duality is there. The wisdom is like the observer. No. Even this wisdom which realizes non-duality, you look, this is the key point. The wisdom which realizes non-duality is experiencing this non-duality in a non-dual form. You're getting it? Object is non-duality, subject is the, is the wisdom, and this wisdom, non-dual is the, the object, this wisdom is a subject, is experiencing this non-dual object in a non-dualistic form. That is Shri. You're getting it? It's so profound. It's so profound. So, if you can recite this in Tibetan, 
independent it is shiri heruka shiri heruka shiri heruka shiri heruka he ni kungujun he the first one he ni kungujun is give a same te gu tanyu to tabar chebe tombe chuge tame batan ru ni khansa ge dadu se me nam do ge chabe ge dada te me khansa ge dame batan ka ni te khona ni yu je ni me tu me so so ni su me ne batan shiri ni yu tomba ni chi da wa de shin de jesus shu be ni su me bi shi ni e wam gi te no this is the Tibetan version. You can recite, you can learn this in English. Or you can learn this in Tibetan if you be, be try to, to know the meanings precisely. They're also very blessed. In English as possible. Okay. So with folded hands, three the, let's say this, the sacred name three times. And then the, if you, if you have some exposure to Tantra, then you can, you know, visualize the Shri Hiruga deity there. Otherwise, you can visualize Buddha Shakyamuni. Because Buddha Shakyamuni himself manifested in the form of these various deities, like Shri Guya Samaja, Shri Chakra Samvara, Shri Hiruga, Shri Hiruga, Shri Chakra Samvara, same. And then Shri, and then Shri Vajra Parva, Shri He Vajra, Shri Vajra Kileya, Okay, so all these, um, you know, what the Buddha Shakyamuni himself manifested. So you can visualize the Buddha Shakyamuni. Whereas if you're exposed to tantric teachings, you know some details of the tantric teachings, on the basis of which you have a profound devotion, respect, and so forth. Just think about some unique aspects of tantra. Unique aspects of tantra, it makes your body, like with the tickling sensation, goosebumps come in the body. Such a respect, such a the, the devotion comes to your mind with such awe, which means that your mind, ability to see the nuances, it has developed to a very rich level. Which means that only when your mind, or it is only through studying these texts, this text that you want to become very sophisticated and agile, and through this, then you can appreciate the, the Tantra's unique presentations. The popular Tantra is not really Tantra. It's not really Tantra. The real Tantra, you see the, 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 the nuanced experiences, the very subtle experiences, so powerful. See, this light that we have, this light is a huge, it's a massive purpose. It cannot burn the, the papers. It cannot burn the word. And this light, channelized, make it a laser beam, very fine laser beam. It's not pervasive. Laser beam, it can burn the word. So Tantra is about the very subtle, channelizing the subtle energy. It's nothing to do with the very popular Tantra, which, you know, or tantra, tantra, which you know, people started to abuse Tantra. This is the very total misconception. Total misconception. It is about some other Tantras. Non-Buddhist Tantra is fine. It has its own you know, thing. But the Buddhist Tantra, it is an incredibly profound experiences. So these, to appreciate, to to get to this level of the mind, where you can appreciate these nuances on the basis of which you just feel the, the subtle presentations there, like the whole light channelized into the, 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 the laser beam. Very fine, not like this massive, very fine. It can really burn the whole world. So this is the, the power of Tantra, practice of Tantra, the unique presentation of Tantra. This is not what is taught in Sutra, because the general audience of the people, their mind is not that trained into this, the going to go into the subtle nuances. So these studies, Pramana Vartika and so forth, they will allow us to make a mind very agile to, to appreciate the subtle nuances. Okay, for example, let's say on these, some people say, even with the food, with the food, some people, they can easily see the, the, the difference. Oh, this food, the oil is heavy. Some, oh, this food, the oil, oil is light. They can easily distinguish. We cannot distinguish. The, what is that? What is he talking about? The food is good. No, the oil is so heavy. They can distinguish this because they have this very nuanced way of seeing the differences. The, the, the differences. And for, for example, the Mona Lisa painting, right? Original Mona Lisa painting and the, 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 the later Mona Lisa painting, in our eyes, these two are just the same. In most cases, even the later ones are more beautiful. <laughs> but whereas those with the eyes to see the distinctions, no, this is just the later ones. This is not the original. Original one is very distinct. You should have that eyes to see that. You should have that mindset, the mindset and the mental equity to see the nuances of Tantra. Okay, let's say this three times together. 
シリヘルガーシリヘルガーシリヘルガー He is the selflessness of phenomena, the emptiness of the mind, which is the source of everything, as it is imputed to be of causal nature. Ru is the selflessness of person, the emptiness of the self that is fabricated by the web of conceptual thought that grasps. Ka is the ultimate reality, the absence of the dissonant duality of the subject and object. Shri is the non dual exalted wisdom that abides in congruence with the emptiness of the object. This is the meaning of A1. Oh, yes. I have a question about the,、uh, the visualization, about、uh, the first part on the He,、mm. when you dissolve the diversity into the mind. Yes. Right? And then the mind into emptiness. Yes. So this part is a. Uh, subjective, I mean, objective mind. Objective mind meaning,、uh, let's say, your own mind. The, is you part of phen considered phenomena? Okay, let's say, okay, this is a very serious question, I can see that. Say, you, I, then my body first, I, then my body, my mind, they, be, what, they become. My, right? Which, which you possess, your possessions. So, self versus your possessions and the other things. Your possessions, they fall under the category of phenomena other than the person. The self is the person. So, in this context, in this context the self is the person and your possessions and all other things. Fall under the phenomena. Phenomena does not necessarily outside there, right? Even your mind inside, experience, even that experience of pain, happiness, devotion, faith, wisdom, they all, they for all fall under the phenomena, right? Okay, good. Yes. And, and so the next one, where you dissolve,、uh, the next one, where the, the, what's it? The rule, right? You, the selflessness of the person. Ru is the, the person. Usually, is when we fuse the eye. Yes, it? yes. The label. That, yeah. Not the label. Not the Labeled. Labeled. Which is, you can sort it the、uh, subjective mind. No. No, still not. The person,、uh, seeing, they say the person, I, right? Okay, this, for this, we have to make a distinction between the. Distinction between the What is I? What is the self? What is this I? What is the self?、Uh, between Prasangika and the other schools. Prasangika would say that this I is just impure self, impure self on the basis of the body and the mind, I. Where, where, is,、uh, where is Shan? Shan or Shan? Where is Shan?、Huh? Okay, where is Shan? I'm here. The moment you say I'm here, For Prasangika, finish. This is Shan. You don't explore deeper. The moment you explore deeper, Shan will disappear. Right? Whereas the lower schools, they say, Where is Shan? I'm here. Which one? Your body or your mind? My mind. Lower schools, what is convention accepted? Still, they go beyond to say that Shan is findable, beyond the mere conventionality is findable. My, Shan's mind is findable as a Shan. You're getting it? So, therefore, for those schools, this is a presentation. Whereas for, for Prasangika, Shan is a person that said, don't go into the mind. Mind, all these things become the phenomena other than the person. So, it's a label, just a label. Okay, label and labeled, these are different. Oftentimes, people say everything's labeled. This is, there is a danger. This is technically this is not correct. But if the great teachers, like His Holiness the Dalma says, they're saying differently. These are just labels, meaning they just come into being. They're not really there. They come into being by the power of the label. That's it. Whereas we, if we try to say, if this is label, means, label means words. If it's a word, the flower's word is not a word. Word is to be heard, heard by your ear. The flower you cannot hear by the ear. Right? So the labeled, everything's just labeled. Whereas in some texts, you do find they said everything's labeled. So there it is a very,、uh, say, the present, everything coming to being by the power of the label is put in a very simple words everything's labeled. 
is not the real meaning. The real meaning is everything comes into being by the power of the label. Everything is not label, technically speaking. Okay. Is it a mantra we do with the beads as well? Or just say it three times? Okay, with the beads, if you want to recite the mantra for like 21 times, 108 times, you use the beads. Yeah. Or even the three times, I don't need to use the beads, no need actually. The bead on the one hand, it is just a reminder. Reminder or not to forget the number, not to lose, to lose track of the number. Right? Okay, I'm recite the, I'll recite the mantra, Om Mani Pimo, hundred, uh, three, they, like 300 times. And then, Om Mani Pimo, Om Mani Pimo, then you lost the number. So to, not to lose number, we use this beat. And then the beat becomes very important. <laughs> there are so many mantras, right? the short ones. How about you select which ones to, to say? Okay, yeah, what we do is so that, many mantras. We, hopefully, 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 we'll finish this text, um, the second session. Afternoon session, afternoon first session is exclusively for question answers. You're getting it? So any question that you might have, not necessarily with Brahman, the best Brahman Vartika, then even if you have something outside Brahman Vartika and you feel that it's very pressing, Brahman Vartika, any question that you might have, bring this up. Outside Brahman Vartika, Meaning, not related to Pramana Vartika. If you think it's very pressing, ask me. Right? Bring this up. If I cannot give the answers, others should help me. Yeah. Okay. Where were we yesterday? Huh? One? One, three, five. Okay, so 135, what is being said there is the cause, the cause of samsara, cause of samsara is attachment to one's body, attachment to one's aggregates, attachment to one's aggregates, the attachment to which is given rise to by the self-grasping ignorance. That attachment is the cause of suffering. Okay, so just for information, that and the, the texts, and they point to the root of suffering differently. Some texts, they said that attachment is the root of suffering, root of samsara, root of suffering, final cause of suffering. And other texts, you will see that self-grasping ignorance is the final cause of suffering. And in some other texts, you will say that the, the, the imprint of the self-grasping ignorance Imprint of self grasping is self grasp the uh, what this the co ultimate cause of suffering. In some cases, self centered attitude is the final cause of suffering. There are so many versions there. They should not be seen as contradictory. They should not be seen as contradictory. Okay, when you say attachment is the cause of cause of ultimate cause of suffering means that suffering, nobody is pushing us to suffering. Somehow we glue to the suffering. How? The glue is known as attachment. Glue, glue means one, one attaches you to samsara. That glue is attachment. So therefore, attachment is said to be the final cause of suffering. One, then the self-grasping ignorance as the final cause of suffering. This is very profound. How? Suffering is suffering, samsara is what? This is samsara. What? This is some, you look around. This is a samsara. We look around, right? What? There's nothing to look around, actually. Your mind created, and yet then you look around, right? Your mind created a dream, and then you look around. Is this dream, right? You created. Your mind created. At the moment you create this dream, this is samsara, right? Creation. Creation. Creation of the world by this self-grasping ignorance. Projection of the world by the self-grasping ignorance itself is samsara, right? So the moment you create this, automatically you are going to be, you are going to be trapped in this, right? The moment you create the dream, you are trapped in the dream. Trap means you have no freedom to come out. 
That is loss of freedom. Loss of freedom, misery. Misery is samsara. Right? Okay, so that's a very profound experience of, a profound experience. Okay, so 135, we read it already, um, I just read it. Attachment of partaker of the composite appropriate aggregates, given rise to by the, the grasping of self and mind, is the cause of suffering. The antidote to that is the realization of selflessness, whose apprehension of the object is mutually exclusive with that of the self-grasping. Yesterday we did that. The, what should be the remedy to overcome the self-grasping ignorance is the wisdom, is the wisdom, is the wisdom which is directly in opposition with the self-grasping ignorance pertaining to the object of apprehension. We mentioned this, we said it yesterday. Okay, so this wisdom plays a very important role. And this, just before we start, just started this, we read this, the, the compilation. From there, just to just see how, I say, or importance, how much the importance is given to the wisdom of emptiness, seeing that as the ultimate means by which to wake us up from the slip of ignorance. That is so the, emphasized by the, the great, the, from, by the Buddha, by all the great saints, all these great teachers. Okay, uh, reference number. Okay, and then also, if you read Bodhisattva Shantideva's chapter 9, wisdom chapter, it opens by saying that okay which means that all these branches of teachings the Buddha gave for the, for the sake of activating the wisdom of emptiness for the sake of activating the wisdom this is what, how the, the wisdom chapter was opened by Bodhisattva Shantideva. And then likewise, um, the Acharya Dharmagirti, Acharya Dharmagirti, the, the next part, next part, the, the second half of Paramatavarta chapter two, there he said that, Tonyi Tawe Tujurgi Kumbhalama The view of the emptiness will liberate the beings. All other teachings are meant to nurture that. So from every, from every direction, we come to we come the clue. We come to get the information. We come to get the. Um, we come to. We are being awakened to realize that it is the wisdom of emptiness which is finally the liberating factor. Okay. Reference number sixty-one. Third, how the results are achieved through meditational practice on what was previously established through learning and reflection. Okay, after learning. Say while learning, you can update, pay, you know, say the uh, the okay importance on recitations and so forth, learning, and then whatever you learned, whatever you learned, then you subject. We have to subject them to analysis or reflection. With the reflection, okay, with the learning, you gather the materials, you gather the ingredients. With the reflection. You gain conviction that, yes, things are all empty of objective existence. That is for sure. Then with the meditation, the third level, with the meditation, then the transformation within your mind happens. So the inkling of the transformation happens during the, the first, you know, during the second, during the reflection, inkling. Just a tinge of trans transformation. A little bit of transformation happens at the time of the second with the reflection. Say the impulsive. And then I uh, say some people, uh, some, uh, some, what they do is then, okay, impulsively you become angry. That's fine. Then you continue to continue to hold grudge. And even somebody says that these are all dream like, what dream like? You know? So they are all sentient beings. Your mother sentient beings. What mother sentient beings? Look at this person. So nasty. Just continuously, just what you want. What is the English word? Festering. Huh? Festering. Faster. Festering. It just continues to faster rather than, okay, yes, I impulsively acted so angrily. This is not correct. I'm wrong. No, they don't admit. Right? Some people, they say, they, they study, they study, you know, 
the text, and then they have a little short tempered. Then when I say that, okay, calm down, calm down. What should I come? Calm, I should come down towards this person. This person. Terrible. I said that if this is your attitude, there's no point. If this attitude. So impulsively you become angry. That's fine. It'll take a little time. But even after you know, settle down, still holding grudge. Holding grudge. This is too much. This is something which we can control. For example, like verbally abusing others, verbally abusing others. And sometimes when the anger inside is so intense, then verbal becomes un the, the uncontrollable. That's fine. But then usually verbal, physical, these two are under your hands, in your hands. These two must be under control. So when you speak about shila, then the samadhi, prakya, shila is to control the physical and the verbal. The mindfulness and introspection, mindfulness and introspection, we have to build the mindfulness and introspection. Mindfulness and introspection, these two determines our actions. What actions? Destructive actions, constructive actions. With the loss of the mindfulness, mindfulness and introspection, then we tend to go into the destructive actions. With the mindfulness and introspection, then we tend to remove, pull ourselves from the destructive actions and go into the constructive actions. So, mindfulness, and introspection, the first training must be to do with the mindfulness and introspection pertaining to the body and the physical actions. So that forms the training the mindfulness, mindfulness and introspection pertaining to, the, pertaining to the bodily and verbal actions is known as the shila or the discipline. Then once this is under control, then you go into the mind, the training the, the, training the mind which controls the mental actions. That becomes a samadhi. That becomes a samadhi. With this samadhi, then the mind is perfect, under the stability is gained. With the stability, then use the stability to focus on emptiness. That is the pragya. Okay. So therefore the point, what, again, we have to take some steps. After learning all these things, we have to take steps. First step that we need to take, as we said, is that at least the obvious, obvious things which we can control, physical and verbal, which is particularly yesterday we discussed about the ten non virtuous actions. They're mostly the same, the three physical and four verbal. So these seven, see if you can control these seven. And these seven somehow they are rooted to the three mental, rooted to three mental, connected to the three mental. So just see how you can refrain from the physical and the verbal non non virtuous actions. How much? Okay. So the uh, what we are talking about is the study, reflection, and a meditation. So with the reflection, when you get an inkling, some a tinge of experience of emptiness, then you become convinced that okay. The things don't exist the way they appear to me. Then sometimes impulsively you may act, but then holding grudge, these things will dissolve when you get some experience of emptiness. Holding grudge or resentment, this will dissolve when you gain the experience of emptiness on the basis of the reflection, level two, this grudge. The, the long-term anger, long-term, you know, the, the attachment, anger, jealousy, so forth, this will dissolve. The impulse, you know, impulsive, the negative thoughts can ar arise. Then, even the negative impulsive thoughts should be calmed down. For that, we need the third. So we have to translate the first and second into the third, which is meditation. So it says, reference number 61, third, how the results are achieved through meditation practice of what was previously established through learning and reflection. We cannot bypass learning and reflection. We cannot bypass learning and reflection. So it says, meditation of what was previously established through learning and reflection. This is so important. Otherwise, many people, they are easily deceived by saying that, what is study, reflection, your life is so short, go directly into practice. What should you practice without having the materials to practice? Right? So, in fact, the, there was once the one merchant, one merchant, a big merchant, a businessman in Tibet many years ago, perhaps like maybe 12th, 13th century, 
11th century was Jesu Milarepa's era, Jesu Milarepa, who became Buddha within a single lifetime. And then the, uh, maybe around 12, 13, later, later, there was a businessman and who happened to get hold of Jesu Milarepa's biography of that one. He read this and he was so inspired. Wow, it's amazing, <laughs> right? Amazing, without studies and reflection. Right? Amazing, yes, it's, it's very, a story, it's very, it'll inspire you instantly. He's so inspired, he said that, this is samra, amsara, I must quit samsara, right? I must practice dharma, I must become one, one like Jesus Milarepa. Then what we would have, he was a rich person. He has a lot of properties, the possessions, and so forth. So he distributed all these to his family members, this brother, sister, cousin, and distributed it. Then he went to the mountain to do what? To practice, to become Jesu Milarepa, second Jesu Milarepa. So he went there, he was sitting. First day is fine. First day is fine. Second day, then he started to feel hungry. Third day, feeling cold, hungry, cold, and nothing made you close the eyes, nothing comes to mind. What, what am I doing? I'm just sitting, right? First day is fine, just sit like this, you think that you're meditating. Second day, you realize that this sitting, nothing's really happening, right? Sitting. And the third day, fourth day, fifth day, then he re he's like a rabbit, right? Rabbit also sit like this. And I'm also sitting like this. There's no difference. And then, on the summer, then I feel hungry. No food is coming now. I feel cold. No blanket coming. And rain drizzles. There's no, the what? The roof there. Then day five, six, he started to become so angry. Because physical pain is so acute. It is not something that we can, you know, just say, okay, I want to quit, I want to quit this. No, physical pain is so acute, he becomes so angry. Because the tendon is anger is there, right? And nothing to meditate, because study and reflection is missing. And then, then he becomes so angry, now he cannot go back. Because he has already given everything. How can he say that you now return all the what he given you? He cannot do that. He becomes so angry towards Jesus Milarepa. He said that this beggar, he made me another beggar like him. He made me another beggar like him. He's a beggar. He made me another beggar, right? So this is why. Because we are just, we have to, we have, we are not to just fantasize ourselves. Okay, I'll put effort and tomorrow I'll become Buddha. Don't fantasize that. We have to accept the reality. Who are you? Somebody who has acute imprints of anger, jealousy, craving for food, craving for say house, craving for good things. When there's cold, cannot bear it. These imprints are there. This is who I am. So with this, we can't expect to become Buddha tomorrow, the very next day, right? Just by sitting like this. We can't expect that. For that, we need a very systematic steps, systematic steps. For some people, we have to make dharma very easy, right? You have to provide the cushions. You have to provide the books. <laughs> Sometimes, hey, come, hey, come, we'll have tea together, right? Make it very easy, comfortable. Otherwise, they even don't feel connected with the dharma. The moment you say that, uh, bring your own, own cushion, and bring your own books, mm -hmm. right? Or bring your own books, and then say, silence, right? The next 10 days, silence. Nobody's allowed to talk. What are you doing? You came here, with silence. Why, Anila, why are you talking? Right, silence. This is not for me, we leave then. The next time, dharma, no dharma, bye-bye. Right? We should be extremely skillful. We should be extremely skillful. We have to, first of all, acknowledge who we are. Your limitations. Your limitations should not, should not drown you. Your limitations, yes, these are my limitations. Yet, these limitations are not my true nature. My true nature is limitless. My true nature is fearless. My true nature has tremendous patience. My true nature is, has this, the skill and the quality 
which does not require any external factors for me to be happy. But I'm not that yet. These are in my, these are my, the, the treasure inside, obscured by the mental developments. Mental developments are very thick at the moment. So I need to work on these. We have to acknowledge who we are. On that basis, then we take the steps, slow steps, slow and steady. Hey, slow and steady wins the race. This is how we have to begin. Take a slow steps and steady. Dharma practice, do small. Don't focus on, I have to do Dharma practice for three hours, two hours, four hours. Right? Then you will lose the, you will lose the continuum very soon. S start small. Start small. Emphasize, don't emphasize on the volume. Emphasize on the consistency. Emphasize on the consistency. Start small. This is something which we have not, not done before. Because of which ease is not there. When you first come to Chen Shui Temple, or when you first move to another town for your job, you feel uneasy. Why? Because this is a place which is unknown. When you're doing something unknown, natural tendency is that we feel uneasy. There's unease there. So, do small. If you do it big, uneasy is big. Then you don't want to do it, you will quit it. So do small, uneasy is small. So uneasy is small, you can bear it. Keep it small. Meanwhile, Consistency is more important. With the consistency, you become familiarized. The familiarity comes. Once you come to know the town so well, I know this person there, I know this person there, in this shop, this shop, so forth, you know, then you feel at home. Once the consistency is built, then the familiarity comes. With the familiarity, ease comes. Unease disappears. With the ease, you can increase the volume. This is how we have to practice Dharma. Otherwise, often as we see, it is like the small child making the, making the what? Timetable. Study timetable, closer to his exam. And then you quit this timetable in two days. Right? This is how many people practice Dharma. Okay. One, three, six. Familiarizing. Okay. Familiarizing in multitudes of means through various. Oh, we read this already. Huh? We read this already, no? I, re I remember it, we read it. <laughs> no, sometimes when our mind hangs, we think, that we, have, we think that we have not read it. I think that I read it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Familiarizing in multitude means. Multitude means here refers to the in terms of time. In terms of time. In a multitude form, or let's say many times. It's not really means as such, means in, te in the in technical sense. Familiarizing in multitude, multitude of means, multitude ways, mul not ways, multitude times, through various ways. Various ways refers to the six perfections. Practicing the six perfections in the multitude, the multitude times. Over an extended period of time, like, okay, many for a long time, Okay, so the one is the extended period of time. Say for like, say 10 years, one life, two lives, three lives. And within, okay, I have to practice Dharma for the, say, for every year. Then every year you take out one day. One day practice. Oh, now once my share of the Dharma practice for this year is done. So this is very, every year you're doing for 10 years, 20 years is amazing. But what you're doing is very little within the span of one year. So no, within one year you have to do it multiple times. That is the multitude of means through various ways for how long? For an extended period of time. One then becomes the one with omniscience. Only through this, driven by the force of bodhicitta, then the wisdom of emptiness, the means to achieve Buddhahood, practice this multitude of times a day, over an extended period of time, then your mental defilements will be cleansed. Cleansed, first the gross ones, afflictive obscurations, then the subtle ones, cognitive obscurations, and the Buddha energy insight will come out fully. That is when you become an omniscient one, one with omniscience. To vividly perceive all the faults and benefits. Okay. When you become Buddha, when your mind becomes omniscient, then what does it do? It vividly knows every atom of the universe. 
This mind, your mind, one single instant of your mind will know every atom of the universe, every mind of the sentient beings. So what it says here is, perceive all the faults and benefits, meaning the faults of samsara and the benefits of awakening. The faults of samsara and the benefits of the, benefit, the benefits of nirvana and buddhahood, awakening. Okay, the faults to be abandoned and the benefits to be adopted. The faults of samsara to be abandoned and the benefits of nirvana and buddhahood to be adopted. So this is what the Buddha, the, when you become Buddha, when somebody becomes Buddha, this is what they vividly realize. So this is what all the sentient beings are seeking. What to adopt? What to abandon? How to abandon and how to adopt? For this we need to know the, the dharma. We need some guide. So that guide we call as a reliable guide. We are seeking not just a guide, but a reliable guide. 137 aim. Therefore, with the mind to see all phenomena so vividly, with the mind to see all phenomena, so vivid, meaning this omniscient mind, to see all phenomena so vividly, every atom of the universe, every mind of sentient beings, then all imprints, all imprints of the cause of suffering. The cause of suffering, that's cause of suffering, Imprints. Cause of suffering is more to do with the, the, the samsaric, samsaric cause, but imprints. Imprints both subtle and the gross. The gross one referring to afflictive obscurations, subtle imprints referring to the carnivore imprints. So in other words, all the imprints, all the, the, all the defilements, afflictive and cognitive obscurations, all are eliminated. This is when you become the fully enlightened being, and you become the reliable guide. Reference number 62. How the results thus achieved stand distinct from those of other vehicles, such as the vehicles of Shravakas and Pratyaka Buddhas. Okay, so once you achieve this state, where all the mental defilements, mental defilements are eradicated, and you achieve the state of omniscience, to know every atom of the universe, every phenomenon, in what way this achievement is distinct from the achievements of the Shravakas and Pratik Buddha. So in what way? That's different. That's different. 137b. <clears throat> That is what marks the difference between the great Muni who engages in the well-being of others and rhinoceros like Pati Buddhas and so forth. Okay, so the difference lies in what? Now you tell me, what's the difference? If somebody asks you, after learning, after studying Pramana Vartika, so you come to study the, the distinction between the achievement, enlightenment of the Buddhas and enlightenment of the Shravakas and Pratik Buddhas. Okay, what is the difference? Pratik Buddhas, Shravakas on the one hand, Buddha, on the other hand, what's the difference in terms of the attainment of the enlightenment? What's the difference? Very quick, just speak your mind. There are so many distinctions, not just one or two. Anyone? Okay. Uh, yes, Yen? It's not personal liberation and uh, enlightenment. Okay. Shravaka Prati Buddha is for personal, whereas the Buddha is for form. All sentient beings. Pavanila. <coughs> so just follow. Uh, Prateka Buddhas and Shravakas get rid of afflictive obscurations, whereas um, Buddhas get rid of uh, cognitive obscurations as well. Okay. So Prateka Buddhas and Shravakas, they eradicate the afflictive obscurations, and the Buddhas, Buddhas they eradicate both afflictive obscurations as well as the cognitive. Kimla, same. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so what they, what two of them said is perfect. What three of them? What Yen said is that one is a personal liberation, liberation just for oneself. One is the liberation for all, for others as well as for oneself. How Shravakas, Buddha, Buddhas, they only able to achieve the enlightenment just for themselves, personal liberation. Why? Because they could not eradicate the cognitive obscurations. They eradicate only afflictive obscurations. Why? When you become a Buddha, you're able to liberate all others plus liberate yourself. It's because you have eradicated not only afflictive obscurations, you also eradicated cognitive obscurations. Very good. This is the distinction. Uh, reference number 63. 
reason for Pramana Samucha's word of salutation to mention the teacher immediately after compassionate intention to render benefit to sentient beings. Okay, is it so? Teacher, immediately after compassionate intention? Where? Where? Where was this said? Teacher, after compassionate intention? Um? Jason? Huh? Okay, the, the, yes, wow, Jason is amazing. He's saying the words directly, right? Okay, yes, these two words, these two lines, these two lines of, lines of salutation said by Acharya Dignaka in Pramana Samuchaya when he said, the one who has transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by, okay, reliable guide, what is this? And this is the main thesis, this main thesis, which we are still yet to come to, right? Thesis. So this thesis is, is tenable, is feasible, because motivated by the altruism to benefit all sentient beings. One, what is this? What is described here as the compassion. Then immediately after that, then Ashur Dinaka said, the teacher. So the teacher has said immediately after that, what is this teacher? Okay, this question. Uh, 138. Okay, we need a little bit of translation editing. Okay, I will say this and you try to the, say wherever change required, you do it. Since practicing the means, since practicing the means, since practicing the means is the causal factor. Since practicing the means is the causal factor for the actual omniscient teacher. Since practicing the means is the causal factor for the actual omniscient teacher, comma, comma, it is accepted with the second line. It is accepted with the reference teacher. You got it? Okay, let me say this once more. Since practicing the means is the causal factor for the actual omniscient teacher, comma, second line, it is accepted with the reference teacher. Okay, now this is not complete. Now, words from the words you have already written, some words should be in bracket, translators addition. Okay, annotation. Uh, so what are those, th this will go into bracket is, the causal, causal will go in the bracket. Causal, in bracket. Then, for the actual omniscient teacher, for the, for the actual omniscient teacher, this all will go into the bracket. For the actual omniscient teacher, this will go into, in, in, inside the bracket. And then, the second line, the second line, the second line, with the reference will go into bracket with the reference. It is accepted with the reference. With the reference, we'll go in bracket. Bracket open, with the reference, bracket close. And the bracket close after teacher, delete this. Bracket close after the teacher, and delete that part. Okay. So now what it says here is that why, why the teacher comes immediately after the Compassion, which is the altruism. Why? It comes after the, after the compassion. The reason is, since practicing the means, which means, okay, be mindful. When you use the word, the means, in, okay, English, one, we are using English words. So therefore, the translators may differ in using the, uh, using the different words. Different in using the, the words. Then another, in, even in, within Tibetan, which is a very st standardized, translators, they are not entitled to use, you know, different words on their own. Tibetan is standardized by the king. There's a, the, the committee there, translation committee there, formed under, directly under the supervision of the king. So, the, this translator, group of the translators, they decide, they decide what words should be used. All these vocabularies were standardized. It's not that, okay, I can translate this from Sanskrit, translate it, you, then you use your own words. No, not allowed. 
make sure that it tallies with the standards set by the king, standards by the scholars under the supervision of the, under the auspices of the king. Okay, so the, uh, so therefore we should be exceptionally sensitive when somebody uses different words like you know, means to achieve, ways to achieve, factors to achieve. So many words can be used. Be you, as long as you know the concept, you know the concept so well, these words, it doesn't really matter as much. You, concepts should not be missed. Oftentimes in the universities, the PhD students and even the professors, they are so, you know, stuck up with the words. They don't, they are not really on the, the concepts. There could be exceptions. Some brilliant scholars are there, professors, and they're exceptions. Otherwise, generally, they're so stuck up with the, the words, or oh, in this text, this word is used, in that text, this word is used. Know the concept. Once you know the concept, you transcend the words. Words are to convey the meaning. Yeah. Okay. So what it says here, since practicing means, the means here is with the motivation, yes, I should liberate all beings from the suffering. What are you going to do? How are you going to liberate? I have to teach them the wisdom, right? So through the wisdom, wisdom is used as the means to liberate them. So the means here refer to the wisdom of selflessness, wisdom of emptiness. The means here is the wisdom of emptiness. S since practicing the means, which is the wisdom of emptiness, is the causal factor. Finally, you have to become Buddha to benefit all beings. Okay, tell me, how does it help if you become Buddha to benefit all beings? Tell me, anybody. How does it help? Brother Peck? Um, how does it help certain beings? If you become a Buddha. If you become a Buddha, then you know how to become a Buddha. You can teach another person to become a Buddha, and therefore when the other person becomes a Buddha, then uh, that person is also free of afflictions and uh, connective, uh, connective as a word, obscurations and sufferings. What's that? Okay, how does it help if you become a Buddha to benefit all beings? What Brother Peck said is amazing. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes. Pavanila. Because the Buddha has perfect love, perfect uh, knowledge and perfect power, all of which are required to be able to help. Okay, uh, why do we need three, these three things? Why not just omniscience? Why do we need three things? Okay, this is a good answer. That we need somebody in order to help others. We, the person needs three things. Perfect love, perfect knowledge, and perfect power, right? The moment you become Buddha, you have these three perfections. These three perfections allow you to help all beings instantly. Okay, in what it helps with these three things? CJ? Um, okay, Sheila, maybe you can use your analogy of the boy and the father. The boy needs to study for his exam. Then his father, although has, um, you know, great compassion to help him, but doesn't know how to teach him. For example, exam in physics, his father is a count, uh, maybe a, a, someone who does um, other jobs, so he doesn't know physics. So he, the father, no matter how compassionate he is, he doesn't have the knowledge to help him. Yeah, so this one energy. Good. Yeah. Then what, the, what about next two? Then, okay, then the father referred the boy to the neighbor. The neighbor is a good physician, maybe a Nobel, Nobel laureate in, in physics. But then the physician, sorry, the physics professor next door, the neighbor, he isn't too compassionate. He doesn't want to help the boy. So even with perfect knowledge, but without perfect love, um, it, um, it doesn't help the boy as well. Wonderful. The third? The third is the mother. So the mother has love, and also the mother knows physics that can help the boy. But the mother is sick, so doesn't have the power to help the boy. <laughs> okay. So, so therefore so you need means, all three. Okay, wonderful. That's yes. amazing. Thank you, CJ. For somebody to be a perfect teacher to benefit the beings, you should, in the first place, you should have the perfect knowledge. 
perfect knowledge. Whereas, if the father promised the child that I'll help you if you are interested, if you should study well, and I'll almost really help you. And the child one day asked the father, okay, tomorrow's my physics test exam. Please teach me physics. The father said, I don't know physics. I'm very sorry. So father cannot help because he's lacking the knowledge. Then the father sends the child to the neighbor who is a good physicist. And the neighbor said, per hour, it is 1,000 ringgit or 1,000, no, 500 sing dollars per hour. Very expensive. So child cannot pay that. Because the physicist, this the father will never say, mother will never say. Physicist said it because he doesn't love the child. So one needs the perfect love. Even the physicist could not help the child. Then the, the mother, mother has a good knowledge of physics, although not a professor in physics. For a child, young child is fine. So the, the mother comes, mother loves, mother has the love, mother has the knowledge, but the mother was sick. She couldn't help. So in order for somebody to help others, very precisely, one need these, one should be freed of these, and they're freed of three limitations. Limitation of knowledge, limitation in love, and limitation in power. In other words, you should be perfected in three qualities. Perfect love, perfect knowledge, and perfect power. Okay, CJ, thank you. Okay, now, um, since practicing the means, yes, Sharon, Yes. Uh, Gashila, for knowledge, we know we can learn. Uh, for knowledge, we know we can learn through all these retreats and whatnot. Yeah. Love also is like compassion. We can actually accumulate it and uh, cultivate it. But how do we acquire this power? Okay. Okay, this is a good question. Good question. Um, okay, this is a good question. Anybody, how to build the power? Thai? Hi, Gushila. My understanding of power is uh, having the ability to have the skillful means to teach. So for Buddha, he will know how receptive is a listen, the, the, the listener. That's okay, the, but the mother power. has the skillful means to teach, but the mother yes. is sick. Sorry? Mother has the skillful means to teach, but she is sick. No, she I, cannot I, I, help. I'm not uh, referring to that analogy. I'm okay. saying that my understanding of power is that okay, Buddha now has the skillful the, means. The yeah. reality, what CJ said, huh? makes sense. If you are powerless, if you don't have the power, if you don't have the power, you have the knowledge. Skillful, skillfulness to teach the knowledge. Even the skillfulness, even that is the knowledge to teach others. Then the love. If you are physically, mentally so exhausted, you cannot teach. Right? So exhausted means you don't have the energy, you don't have the power. So that's meaning. So how to build this power? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, Jason? Kishida, is it based on the knowledge the Buddha himself practiced it and then he gained realization on it? And through this realization, he realized that this knowledge is applicable to all sentient beings. That's how he has the power to convey this knowledge to sentient beings. Okay, this is much more the same, right? Power to convey, meaning in a way no. it is saying the skillfulness to convey. No, as in, no? he, he practiced it himself first. Yes, so he yes. So gained the realization So the, the mother also practiced it herself, the mathematics, chemistry, uh, but physics. When she was sick, she cannot teach that, although she practiced herself. Okay, anyone? Okay, Vinita ji. I'm just thinking aloud. To me, power um, connects to merit. So oh. I, think, I think accumulating the power, the energy through merit. Okay. Through virtue. Thank you. That's amazing. Wonderful. So the morning when we take the aspiration Bodhisattva vow, what we said is that I go for refuge in the triple gem. Then what? I confess the negativities individually. Then? I rejoice in the virtues all the pains. What is that for? I confess the negativities of, I confess the negativities in the, what is that second line for? To clear the road, right? Clear the road. Okay, now the road is clear. Now the car doesn't have fuel. 
car does not have the power to move. Road is very clear, and you are sick. You cannot walk, right? Now you, you need to have the energy, the power, energy, right? How to build the energy? What is the third line? I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. So look, all these are connected. If you can connect the dots, you will feel such a joy. This is dharma, beautiful dharma. Thank you, Vinidaji. Okay, so the, the power is same. What we see as a physical power, for example, okay, I'll give you one example. Um, Okay, some of you already heard the story that the new, those who are new here, um, and others also, this, even those who heard it, this is extremely good for us to activate the seed of compassion. Buddha Shakyamuni was presiding over the congregation, and then they, on the sides of the Buddha were Bodhisattva Arya Vajrapani. Then, then the king Ajat Shatru. Then Mughaliana, Arhat Mughaliana. Then the king of gods, gods and goddesses, Indra. All these big figures were there around the Buddha. Then the huge crowd. Bodhisattva Ari Vajrapani. Vajrapani. Vajrapani means? Holder of the Vajra. So Bodhisattva Arya Vajrapani, he was always holding Vajra in his hand. King Ajat Shatru. King Ajat Shatru, the king of the Magad, that kingdom where the Buddha was the residing. So this king had the air. Had the air meaning he has some kind of confidence or pride that um, he is physically very strong. I'm the most the strong person in this world, physically very strong. So he was so curious. What is this? This Bodhisattva is always holding Vajra in his hand, something holding. What is that Vajra like? He's so curious. And, but he dare not ask him. He dare not ask him. So the Buddha, the Buddha, through clairvoyance, sensing what King Ajahn was going on in his mind, then the Buddha asks Ari Vajrapani, Vajrapani, keep your Vajra on my table. And the Vajrapani respectfully kept the Vajra on the table. Then, then Ajahn was so curious what, what, what the Buddha is going to do. Then the Buddha invited Ajahn Shatru, His Eminence, His Highness, King Ajahn Shatru, please come to pick up the Vajra. He was so happy, Buddha read my mind. Now I'll get the chance. I don't have to look at this, you know, Bodhisattva. Right? I, can, I don't have to ask him. I can directly go there. Buddha is so kind. He went there and he was trying to pick it up like this. Pick it like this. Forget about picking it up. He can't even move it. Then he was trying to move it very, move it with all his energy. He could not. With both his hands, still he could not. He gave up. Then he passed it to the, uh, the King Indra, the king of the gods and goddesses, who also used his Vajra to fight with his enemies. So he turned towards King Indra. So King Indra went there. <laughs> king Indra thought that, oh, yeah, this is like my Vajra. So he picked it up. He could not. He could not move it. Again, he gave up. Then greater than him is greater than him is Mughaliana, Arahat. Arahat who was known as the one with the greatest miracle power. Known as the, the one or known as the one with the greatest miracle power amongst the followers of the Buddha. So he was invited. So then he went into Samadhi to display the power. Samadhi. With the Samadhi, then he went to touch the, the and pick it up, he could not. Again, we went with Samadhi, deeper Samadhi. <laughs> he could not move it. Then Mughalayana literally started crying in front of the Buddha, like a small child. What happened to my power? Now my power is diminished. Buddha said, your power is not diminished. This Vajra, nobody can pick up. Nobody can pick up this Vajra. Nobody can move this Vajra. Your miracle power cannot move this Vajra. 
This vajra can be moved by only by somebody who has a very powerful practice experience of bodhicitta. Only these people can move. Nobody can move this. It is a tremendous power of the bodhicitta. That it is a tremendous power. So Arya Vajrapani is revered, referred to as the, the bodhisattva of the power. This can be lifted, picked up, lifted up by only somebody with the incredible power of the bodhicitta. Then Bodhisattva invited Arya Vajrapani to pick this up. Vajrapani picked this up. Then Vajrapani just with his the thumb and the <laughs> forefinger, with these two things he picked this up and threw this in the sky like a small toy. Picked it up back and kept it there. Ajarshad was so fascinated. I think that I'm the strongest person, the, the, the mightiest person, strongest person in this world. But look at this, I'm just nothing. Then he did not dare to look at Ajarshad Vajrapani. Right? He was looking to the Buddha said, how come that he's able to pick this up like this? And the Buddha enumerated ten qualities. Only if you practice these ten qualities, the bodhicitta grounded on these ten practices, only then can we think of achieving this power to, to move this vajra. So the, the, these ten, most of them are like, say, being kind towards others, being kind towards your parents, being kind towards sick people, and so forth, and maintain humility, to maintain, hum to maintain, to be very humble, to be respectful towards the learned people, and so forth. All these things are enumerated by the Buddha. Okay, so that is the power. The power is literally the power. It's not just skillfulness to teach and so forth. It's literally the power. How the ordinary people understand this power. Okay. Okay, so in this connection, uh, thank you. Good question. Okay, now, practicing, since practicing the wisdom of, since practicing the means is a causal factor for the actual omniscient teacher, it is accepted, it is, it is, which is it, the wisdom, the means, the wisdom of emptiness, the wisdom of emptiness or the wisdom of selflessness is accepted with the reference teacher because this the referent of this label teacher, which is the wisdom of emptiness, is the one which can make yourself the true teacher, Buddha in the true teacher, the omniscient one, and which can make others also omniscient one. So therefore, this is referred to as the teacher, because this is the one which will eventually make you the true teacher. Okay, so the label of the, the resultant, the teacher, the label, the resultant, they say the label, which is in the resultant state. Resultant state is given to the causal state. Causal state. Okay. Um, since following the accomplishment of the two, two, since following the accomplishment of the two, accomplishing what? The intention, which is altruism or the compassion, and the teacher, the, the wisdom of selflessness, after accomplishing these two, after accomplishing these two, the two causal factors, the first of the two resultant states, the two resultant states, there are the four points indicated there as the premises to, to deduce the Buddha to be the reliable guide. The four premises are compassion or the altruism and the teacher with the wisdom emptiness, two, and then the next two are Sugada and the protector, two. The first two are the causes, and the next two are the results. First two are the causes, and the next two are the results. Okay, so since following the accomplishment of the two, the two causes, the compassionate in intention and the teacher of the selflessness, these two, then the two results. Two results, of the two results, the first one, the Sugada, the favorable personal benefit ensued. From these two, from these two, intention of bodhicitta, of the altruism, gave rise to the teacher of the wisdom of emptiness. So with these two intact, then comes the number three. What is number three? Sugada, which is the resultant state, the final benefit. The favorable personal benefit, benefit there too, benefit for the individual and benefit for others. 
Okay. So the benefit form, benefit primarily, benefit primarily for favorable, benefit primarily for the self. For the self is the sugada. Favorable benefit primarily for others is the protector. Okay. So the from the wisdom the compassion arises, the wisdom emptiness, wisdom selflessness, the teacher we refer to as the teacher. From this the sugada ensues. The former two are set with the causes. Former two meaning the compassion, altru the altruism, and the, the wisdom of selflessness or the teacher. These two are seen as the causes. Okay, we'll stop here.